go to Luke chapter 9. <clears throat> Luke chapter 9. Entitled this sermon, as you may have noticed, Rejecting the Cross. And, uh, may, oh, I'm sorry, kids are going. So uh, it's another group. See anybody over four foot five leaving? Going to be suspicious. Okay. Rejecting the cross. The, the question that might come to mind is, you know, is that, is that, is going to, going to believe or reject the cross? Surely not. But I want to try and show you this morning that and certainly it is possible, not in an ultimate sense, obviously, if you're a true believer, it's the whole basis for your salvation. But in terms of our daily walk, we can most definitely reject the cross. And we see some men who did so this morning, beginning in verse 43 of Luke chapter 9. All were astonished at the majesty of God after Jesus had healed this this young boy with a severe case of demon possession, all were astonished at the majesty of God. But while they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying, and it was concealed from them so that they might not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. But not long ago, about a guy who wanted to lose some weight, and so he joined a diet group. And the instructor, in addition to giving the training that would enable the exercise that would help with the weight loss, also would send this inspirational postcard home each week based on, you know, the continued weight loss. Well, one week... The guy didn't lose any weight. In fact, he gained a couple of pounds, so he was curious what kind of a message the instructor would send home. As it turned out, it was quite blunt and to the point. When he looked at the postcard, it said this. It said, I'd like to see less of you next week. (laughs) I got the message across, I suspect. I'd like to see less of you next week. Well, beloved, that's exactly what Jesus' message is to his disciples here like to see less of you, more of me, but less of you. He sees in their reaction to his healing of this poor demon-possessed boy that they are holding firm to their incorrect understanding of things that are going to happen. So they're going with their interpretation as opposed to what actually awaits. Drastic change is coming. And Jesus is doing everything he can to prepare them for it, and they simply are not having it. We called them last week unbelieving believers, and here that unbelief persists. Now you remember back in verse 18, if you were to go back there, you would see this is the place where Peter confesses that Jesus is the Messiah. The apostles have come a long ways to recognize that particular fact, but they still have a long way to go, and Jesus knows that. There's a fundamental disconnect between their concept of Messiah and what reality is going to be. Their concept is that Jesus is going to just roll into Jerusalem one of these days, throw the Romans out, and set up his kingdom. They're not realizing the price that's going to have to be paid in order to provide for that possibility. They still haven't gotten the fact that redemption costs, and it costs dearly. So when Jesus informs them that he must suffer and die, it just doesn't compute. They just don't get it. So Jesus takes three of them, next part of that chapter, Peter, James, and John up to the mountain of transfiguration where, where his deity is revealed and they see his glory manifested in this wonderful shining light, amazing light. And they see him talking with Moses and Elijah about his coming death and resurrection and ascension, his exodus. He is showing them that the kingdom that they anticipate 
is not incompatible with suffering. That in fact, the suffering is necessary in order to provide the price of redemption for those who will be part of the kingdom. He's trying to get this across in words and he's trying to get it across in visual images. But they still don't get it. They prefer to stay on the mountain. They don't want to come down to the valley. And when they do come down and Jesus heals this awful case of demon possession, they begin to kind of come back around. But they're amazed at what Jesus can do and they're ready to encourage him to get on with the kingdom. But by their definition, there's still holdouts. And therein lies the problem. There's too much them and not enough him in their theology, in the way they think, in the way they look at the world. And so Jesus acts. Verse 43 says, all, the, all were astonished at the majesty of God, but while they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to the disciples, let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. Jesus is once again trying to bring them back to reality. Yes, the kingdom is real. Yes, the healings are real. Yes, redemption is real. But there's a price that has to be paid for all of it. He has to die. And guess what? They do as well. Didn't we see that in Luke 9 verse 23, where he told them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, die to self, take up his cross daily and follow me. But here these guys are, believers, yes, but still unbelieving in their daily outlook. Still focused on their view of Messiah rather than that of Jesus. Rather than Rather than taking up their cross daily, they are climbing down off their cross daily. Which may sound familiar. And Jesus is telling them, guys, I need to see a little less of you and a lot more of me. It just needs to be that way. Unfortunately, it's going to take a lot of failure before they finally get the point for good. Unbelief made a mess of their lives. It always does. You can go to the heart of almost any messed up life and find unbelief at the bottom of all of it. Somewhere, some kind of rationalization, some kind of failure to put our trust and belief, confidence in God. Unbelief is destructive. All of us have areas where it's too much us and too little him. And we will pay a price. But here's the thing, beloved, it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. And what I'd like to see us have a see in for a few moments here this morning is to note the the pattern. There's a kind of a pattern of failure here in these few verses. And if we can identify the pattern of failure, we can perhaps pinpoint the areas in our own life where this whole thing has a foothold and break the mold. So what is the pattern? Well, number one, they are distracted by success. They're distracted by success. They're astonished at what they see when Jesus heals this man. They're marveling at everything he's doing. After two years, they're still amazed at Jesus, but that's part of their problem. They're distracted by the success. In their minds, if Jesus has this power to do all of these wonderful things that they've seen, why can't he just basically wipe out his enemies. Why can't he just overpower them anytime? And the truth is, he could. He could overpower his enemies at any time. But then there would have been no redemption. It had never occurred to the disciples that Jesus might willingly go to his death for their sake. They missed the point that this death that Jesus was going to was the plan of God before time ever began for one reason, because it was the only way to pay the penalty for mankind's sin. The only way. 
It was the only possible solution to that problem. But outward success had distracted the disciples. They were off on the idea of success. They, 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 suffering, they were not into that. They were into, let's just keep this thing going. We're on a roll. Why stop it? Left to their own devices. In other words, they would have deep-sixed their own redemption. Beloved, God doesn't define success the same way the world does. I, I hope, hopefully you've learned that or are learning it. God doesn't define success the same way the world does. It's not about how much money comes in. It's not about how many people are attending. It's not about how many miracles are happening. It's not about any of that. Let me tell you what success is from God's perspective. Success is aligning with the will of of God. Success is aligning with the will of God. That's why when Jesus is going to teach his disciples to pray in another chapter and a half, he's going to tell them that part of the prayer should be, thy will be done on earth like it is in heaven. Because that would be success. And in this fallen world, beloved, sometimes success leads to spectacular events and wonderful results. And sometimes it leads to suffering. It was the Lord's will that Jesus come and do all these miracles and so on, right? It was in the power of God that he was doing that, but it was also the Lord's will that he suffer and die. And if we haven't learned and gotten that straight in our mind, we will surely fail just as miserably as the disciples did here. When the miracles cease and when the suffering begins, they want it out. We've got to be sure, beloved, that we're not held hostage to this success syndrome that our world is so into. It's great when God grants it, right? We all want wealth and health and power and worldly success. We all want to be comfortable, but it will not always be so for the true believer in Christ. Jesus tells his disciples in Matthew 10, verses 17 and 18, beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. Persecution, beloved, is part of the deal when you choose Christ. So when we become, when we become distracted by the thoughts of what we think our definition of success is, we have missed the point. We begin to think suffering is an anomaly. It's not. It's just God working in a different way to accomplish his purposes. Distracted by success. What's the second pattern, part of the pattern of these guys? Well, they were disobedient to his command. They were disobedient to God's command. He tells them, let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. Did they do that? No, they didn't. Jesus emphatically tells them that here. Why? Because he's told them this before and it's just not sinking in, right? They were, here's what they were doing. We have to understand this so we understand we can, they were rejecting the cross. They're rejecting the cross. The only thing that would save them. And if they had had their way, they could have never been saved. Are you seeing that, that when you start to put your mind and your way of doing things and, and the way you think it ought to work out against the direct commands of God, you're rejecting the cross. You're rejecting the thing that will save you. They're rejecting the thing that will heal you, although it seems right to you. It seems so right. They thought they knew better than Jesus. He said this in, in Matthew 16, Matthew's account of, the, of Peter's great confession. Here's what Peter said. Well, let's, let's just look at it. Matthew 16, beginning in verse 21. Matthew 16, 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter 
took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned to Peter and said, get thee behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Listen, unbelief will... will, will, will will sink you in the, in the quicksand of, of disobedience faster than you can say the words. Unbelief will take us to the point where we want to correct Jesus. Peter tells Jesus, listen, this isn't going to happen on my watch, Lord. You're, you're, not, going to, you're not going to die while I'm around. He, he missed the point. You know, Jesus had told him, not only am I going to die, but I'm going to be raised again. But Peter was so focused on the die part, he never heard the raised part. He responds, not on my watch, Jesus. Don't talk like that. And Jesus tells him, get thee behind me, Satan. Beloved, when when we disobey, we're rejecting the cross just as surely as Peter was. Doing Satan's will, not God's will. To say to God, you know, don't be talking like that or words to that effect, whatever you know, whatever it sounds like in your language. Don't be talking like that. It's so foolish, right? But it's so human. We do it without even thinking about it. The Bible says, count others more significant than yourselves. And we say, don't be talking like that, Lord. You don't understand how dumb those people are and how much they've already hurt me. Left to their own devices, they're going to paint the church pink. Jesus says, let your light shine before others. And we say, don't be talking that way, Lord. You're going to get me ostracized. Jesus says, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And we say, don't be talking that way, Lord. You don't know what these people have done to me. You don't know how they've stabbed me in the back. You don't know what it's like to be stabbed in the back. And God says, really? Let me take you to the cross. I know it's like, to be stabbed in the back. I'm not asking you anything to do anything I haven't done. I'm not asking you to be anywhere I haven't been. I just want you to take up your cross daily and follow me. And we say, don't be talking like that, Lord. I deserve a break today. Disobedience. We rationalize our way into it on a daily basis. I love what Martin Luther did one time. He had his congregation, right? And he, and he preached the same sermon like three, four weeks in a row. About the fourth week, the people finally recognized, hey, I think that's the same sermon he preached last week. <laughs> I've often been tempted to try that and see how <laughs> long it would be before anybody really caught on, right? But Luther actually did that. And they came to him finally and they said, Luther, don't you have any other sermons? And he said, yeah, I got a whole bunch of them but you're not going to hear any of them until you start doing this one. You're not obeying. You need to obey. I can tell you this, when we start saying, don't talk that way, Lord, disobedience is just right around the corner from that little phrase. You can count on it. Thirdly, they were denying what they didn't like. They were denying what they didn't like. Verse 45, back in Luke 9. But they did not understand this saying, and it was concealed from them that they might not perceive it. That's a fascinating statement to me. I mean, Jesus did say some things that are hard to understand, right? I think we would all agree on that. But let's face it, this is not one of them. This isn't one of them that's hard to understand. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. How hard is that to understand? It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that one out. But yet it says it was concealed from them. How is that possible? Some have said, well, the devil concealed it from them. But there's, there's absolutely nothing in the context to indicate that this is the devil's work to indicate that he could do it even if he wanted to do it. Furthermore, he would have liked nothing 
better than for these guys to believe that the one they thought was Messiah actually was going to die because he knew that would ruin their faith in him altogether. <clears throat> Others have suggested that Jesus is concealing the truth from them himself, but of course that makes no sense. He's the one telling this to them, right? He'd be working at cross purposes to himself if he is telling them and at the same time concealing from them. Others have said, well, it was God the Father. The Father was concealing it from them. But now you have the Son and the Father working at odds with each other, which I don't think is likely either. I, I don't think it was any of those things. So what was it? Well, here's what I think it was. I think this was concealed from them by their own refusal to relinquish their concept of Messiah and his purposes. It was their own refusal. Too much them, too little him. Too much of their own preconceived notions and dreams, too little of the reality that Jesus was trying to teach them and impart to them to prepare them for what was coming. They didn't like the message, so they refused it. Unbelief. Ever been down that street? Remember how Saul went down that street? Jesse preached on it a couple of weeks ago. God told him to go wipe out the Amalekites who had had 400 years to hear the truth of God and to turn in repentance to him and had not done it. And God said, the time is over with. I want you to go kill everything, animals included. And God kept his part of the bargain. He gave Saul the victory, as you recall. But then we get to 1 Samuel 15, 9, where we read that Saul and the people spared Agag, who's the king, and the best of the sheep and the oxen and of the fatted calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. Saul <laughs> just couldn't bring himself to destroy all that good prime rib and leg of lamb, right? Made no sense to him. And he kept the king, of course, to gloat over him. This, I, I, does this resonate with you? This is so us. Just rationalize our way into whatever it is that we want to do. But what do we read in 1 Samuel 15, 22 when Saul, Saul is confronted by Samuel? Samuel says, Saul, let me give you a little principle here. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen. Is that word listen again? All the way through the Bible. To listen than the fat of rams. Listen, let these words sink in. Quit rationalizing long enough to listen. Or like the bus driver down south, you know, taking people on tours of Civil War battle sites. And he said, uh, over here is where, is where we Southerners captured a whole platoon of those Yankees called them something a little different than that. He said, over here is where we routed a whole regiment of those Yankees. Over here is where we captured a thousand of them all at one time. Well, somebody, you know, from somewhere up north looked at the driver and he said, listen, didn't the north ever win a battle? And the guy said, yep, but not while I'm driving this bus. <laughs> not while I'm driving the bus. And that's the problem, beloved. We're driving the bus. There's too much us, not enough him. And so we become unbelieving believers, those who rationalize our way right into whatever it is we want to believe instead of what God is actually saying. One final thing that we see here that was part of their pattern of unbelief that led them to reject the cross, even as believers in their daily life, and that is they were driven by fear. Driven by fear. Look at the end of verse 45. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. Why were they afraid? I can tell you exactly why they were afraid. They were afraid it might all be true. that suffering and death really were part of the equation and they sure didn't want that. Rebellion in their hearts 
kept the meaning of redemption hidden from them. They feared the truth. They didn't want to know that's which they were afraid to know, and so they actually didn't know. It reminds me of that uh, movie, I th- A Few Good Men, I think it was called. It's the one where, it's the one where Tom Cruise gets Jack Nicholson, by whatever their title is, on the, on the stand, remember, in a courtroom. And he asks him some you know, question that's gonna solve everything and Nicholson looks at him with hatred in his eyes and says, the truth, you can't handle the truth. Remember that? You can't handle the truth. That's the way the disciples were. They, they, they couldn't handle the truth. They didn't want the truth and so they didn't know the truth. You know, in some ways we ought to love the disciples for this. They're so human. They're so like us, are they not? Imagine how difficult it would have been to believe that the one who could raise the dead, who'd been healing all of these sick people, who could cast out demons wherever he went, imagine, imagine trying to and being asked to believe that it was in the plan for him to go and die. That would have been difficult. That would have been tough. But in rejecting that truth, they were rejecting not only the words of Christ, they were rejecting all the Testimony in the Old Testament that this is exactly the way the plan of redemption had to work out. Coming to the cross is hard. We want it, you know, we're Burger King addicts. We want it our way, right? And at the cross, you can't have it your way. It's his way. The only thing is we pay a huge price on the other side when we try and do it our way. It's hard to believe that laying up treasure in heaven is a good thing. It seems like pouring effort and time and money down a sinkhole to give it to the work of Christ sometimes, does it not? It's hard to believe that to live a life of sexual purity is really abs- is, is necessary? Surely these things that nobody sees doesn't hurt anybody else? A little dalliance here can't do any harm. It's hard to believe that it's better to die for the sake of Christ than to deny him. Is that really true? Is that really true? I mean, isn't it pretty important to stay alive? Shouldn't we call in question all those Christians in the old days who were dying because they, simply because they wouldn't say, Curious Kaiser. That's all they had to do was to stay alive, was to say, Curious Kaiser, Caesar is Lord. And they wouldn't do it. Weren't they... Foolish, they knew in their hearts that Jesus was Lord. Wasn't that enough? Why give your life for a simple phrase like that? Why? I'll tell you why. Because they knew what Jesus said in Matthew 10, 33, when he said, whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father. And they believed it. They believed it. It was hard. We're not fixed yet, phew. It's hard, it's hard to believe that, right? But they believed it. They believed it, even though it was hard. They, they, thus they lived. The Lord rather than the fear of man. The disciples had hard lessons to learn before they would take up their cross daily. I know what happened. Somebody's put a bug in there that says that's the end, right? That's, I, I, I know what's, just in case you think I don't know. At this point in their lives, the disciples were in many ways still unbelieving believers. They, would, they were about to fail the big test that came at the cross, right? Preferring their own interpretation of things. So when it didn't happen that way, they ran, they hightailed it like so many cowards. Why? because they were distracted by success, because they were disobedient to the commands of God, because they were in denial about that which did not conform to their likening, 
and they were driven by fear. So what changed? What changed is that over time, it became less of them and more of him. Charles Swindoll tells the story about, you know, trying to put a gift together on Christmas Eve for his kids so they'd have it the next morning to open up. He could see the picture of the finished product on the box, working his tail off to try and get it to look like that, but, you know, as morning is about to dawn, he still can't get it there, still not working. So he finally did the only thing left to do. He went out into the trash and he found the instructions. <laughs> and when he brought the instructions in, here's what it said at the top of the instructions. It said, now that you have made a mess of things, please start over and follow these directions. That's what Jesus is saying, beloved, when he says, let these words sink in. Whether you like it or not, whether it fits your interpretation of life or not, whether you think it's all wrong, let these sink in and obey. And that's how life becomes less of us and more of him. And that's how we embrace the cross on a daily basis. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. It challenges us, challenges us, because every, every one of us, myself included, have some places where it's too much us and not enough you. And so I'm praying that you will point those out to us and that when you do, we will obey rather than just go on our own way, insisting that we know better, insisting that our rationalization is the right thing so that you have to just land on us that much harder to get the response that's right. So Father, bless us by giving us the will to obey. I pray this for the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.